For the rest of us, let me encourage you to take your Bibles and have them open to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. <clears throat> when we're worshiping the Lord in a song, do you have other scriptures that kind of begin to roll through your mind as you're singing the lyrics or reading the lyrics and recognizing that in the scriptures God says to the church, awaken. God speaks about his incredible love for us, how great is the love that he's lavished on us that we should be called his children and that's what we are. So how great is this love? It's so great that when you and I are in a place of fallenness and rebellion and sin and and far from God, he offered his son and Jesus said, Father, I'll go. I'll step into harm's way. I'll pay the price. It's Memorial Day weekend and it is a weekend that we remember as a country, sacrifice, blood shed uh, for the sake of freedoms. We remember those who paid with their lives, and so the flag is raised and honor is given, and we remember. It's not about beer and barbecues. It's about blood and that which was paid. And that's true in our nation, but may I suggest to you this morning that there's something of far greater honor something to celebrate, and that is Christ himself. The blood of our Savior, the sacrifice of our God. As Galatians says, it's for freedom that he set us free, and the freedom there was not to indulge our sinful nature and to go off on a tangent and just continue in sin and rebellion against God, but rather to walk in obedience to God and, and do so out of the fullness of his spirit and to walk uh, in that fullness. God's inviting us to come there. Um, there's going to be two words that we're going to focus on this morning. The word build and advance. Build and advance as it relates to spiritual gifts. And I just want us to bear that in mind as you might stop and ponder again. God's word tells us that you and I are soldiers of Christ, that we're part of an army that is fighting for the sake of truth and righteousness and to see people uh, set free from the enemy. And we're to advance the cause of Christ through God's Spirit. Be empowered with His mighty power. Stand firm. Whole armor of God. All those kinds of things. Ephesians chapter 6. And the Spirit of God was given so that we would have what it is that we need. And so as you and I look in 1 Corinthians 12 in particular, as you recall last week, we began to unpack this. Part 1, part 2. This is part 2 this morning. Uh, we began unpacking this verse that says this, about spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't want you to remain ignorant or uninformed. Paul says it's really important for the church to understand this. And the church in Corinth, you remember with me, if you go all the way back to chapter 1 in 1 Corinthians, this church in Corinth has been uh, gifted by God's Spirit in ways unlike many of the other New Testament churches. Uh, this church has been gifted in incredible ways but there has been a misunderstanding that has crept into the church and there's things that are happening as it relates to spiritual gifts that actually has people turned against each other or polarized from each other rather than building and advancing. And what Paul does is he writes a corrective to the church. So chapter 12, 13, 14 in 1 Corinthians is to correct that which has gone astray, that which has fallen into misunderstanding, even excessive behavior, things that are not the way God intends it to be. And so Paul takes a significant amount of time in this portion of scripture to unfold for us, this is what spiritual gifts are, this is how they're to be utilized. You'll remember with me last week, we were reminded that um, spiritual gifts are wonderful, but uh, one needs to be saved first. One has to have a relationship to God through Christ, and it's after salvation that we're in a place that we can receive that spiritual gifting. And the good God's fullness of his spirit is that which is poured out, which we desperately need. And then we're given these gifts, and remember that the purpose of the gifting is for the common good. So I want you to hear these words again. To build Christ's church and to advance the cause of the kingdom. That's why God pours out spiritual gifts on his people. Building and advancing. 
It's not for your ego. It's not to make you look good. It's not to somehow give you a status in, in some way. It's not about that. It's about being the servant of Christ and using the gifting he puts in our lives that will build up the body of Christ and advance the kingdom of God amongst the nations. These are the reasons why the Spirit of God was poured out. It's why the disciples were told by Jesus, wait. I want you to wait for power from on high. I want you to wait for the fullness of God's Spirit because as you wait, when the Spirit comes, you will have what you need to build and to advance the cause of Christ and His church. So last week, we were going through a number of questions about those gifts, and I'm not going to repeat all that this morning. But the last question we dealt with was, so how? You know, how do I use these spiritual gifts? What does that look like? And indeed, what are those spiritual gifts? That's where we left off. And so remember with me in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, if you were to read there, there are nine spiritual gifts that are listed in that portion of Scripture. Um, some people have camped there and said, aha, there's nine spiritual gifts. That's what we need to know. The problem with that is you go to Romans chapter 12, there's some other gifts mentioned that are not mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, and so suddenly nine becomes more. And so if you were to Google a survey on spiritual gifts, you'll see some surveys look for nine gifts, and some for 16, and some for 23. Now I know some of us last week, you were invited to take a free spiritual gift survey and use it and many of you did i'm very grateful i hope that you took the time to do it or you went online and used the other one from uniquely you Uh, did you learn something about god's gifting in your life and where that might be we want to understand these things i'm going to make a suggestion to you this morning though if you saw your email relating to this service there was a um, an attachment that came two pages that lists the spiritual gifts and gives an explanation of it so you can go back later. So if you didn't see it yet, it's okay. Uh, Some of us online might not have even seen the email, okay? But we're going to get it out there to you. If you didn't get it, you can email us, talk to us, and we'll get it out to you. Um, That that particular tool that we're offering, uh, it lists at least 25 gifts and counting. So as I understand Scripture, I just want you to, to work with me here. If you look at 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12... 1 Peter 4, Ephesians 4, Exodus 31, and a number of other passages, you're going to find that that the number of spiritual gifts, the the scripture offers us a list, and at the end of that list is not a period. It's it's a comma followed by the word etc. And the point being that the Spirit of God will supply whatever gifting is needed to build the church and advance the cause of Christ. And I don't believe the Spirit of God is going to fit into your box and mine. He is beyond measure. He is infinite. And I don't think 23 or 25 even does justice. The Spirit of God will provide that which is needed that builds the church and advances the cause of Christ. But he says, let me help you to understand what many of those gifts are. And so here you have a list. And in fact, several lists. This morning, we're going to look at a number of those lists. And as we do so, we're going to go into some detail on some, and others we're going to move through fairly quickly. So the reason I sent out that advanced tool to you with a listing of the 25 or so was a chance for you to go back later and look at it carefully and explore the scriptures and understand the context of the use of some of those gifts. I've broken the gifts down into four uh, categories or types of gifts. And so we're going to start with the speaking gifts, all right? Because in 1 Corinthians 12, that's where Paul starts, all right? He starts with gifts that I'm calling speaking gifts, a a spirit-given ability to communicate something that reveals truth and applies the power of God's word that, that really cuts to the core of who we are. Right? Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any to his sword, and it penetrates the very core of who we are. If we're listening, if we're, if we're responsive to the word of God, then God's spirit can speak to us that way. So what's one of those speaking gifts? Uh, to one, Paul writes, is given through the spirit the message of wisdom. The, this is a Holy Spirit enabling to apply knowledge and truth of God's word to very difficult life circumstances, and it promotes obedience to the word of God and holiness. Words of wisdom. And God's spirit uh, specifically helps people in that way. If you want an example, you could read in Acts chapter 6, Stephen, as he's representing the word of God, 
The scripture says that those who argued against him could not prevail against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. And so here's an example in scripture where you have Stephen uh, gifted by the Holy Spirit with a message of wisdom, so much so that those who were debating with him about the gospel found themselves speechless. They just couldn't even respond back because of the manner in which he spoke. Wisdom, power of God. The message of wisdom. Paul, though, continues to write in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, to another, the Spirit gives a word of knowledge. This word of knowledge means that God reveals something that by his Spirit that you didn't learn. It wasn't taught. You didn't read it somewhere. But rather, it's being revealed supernaturally. God is, is revealing this. And if you want an example of that, you might think of Peter as he's interacting with Ananias and Sapphira. And here's two people that are pretending to make a generous gift to the church, having kept a portion of it back for themselves, but they're acting like the church is receiving all of it. And Peter calls them to task on that. The Lord gives them a word of knowledge and says, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? You know what you did. God knows what you did. I know what you did because God's just showing me that. That's called a word of knowledge. Peter needed it at that moment, and God was absolutely dealing fairly dramatically with that couple because it was causing contamination uh, in in the life of the church. And so here we have uh, that word of knowledge with Peter, Ananias, Sapphira. Um, Notice what Paul says next, to another the gift of what? Prophecy. Prophecy is the supernatural ability to receive and communicate a message from God to his church. It can relate to the present. It can relate to the future. It's meant to strengthen, to encourage, to exhort, or to warn the church. And you can see multiple examples in the scriptures. Uh, So you've got uh, Philip's four daughters who had the gift of prophecy. Uh, Agabus, another person mentioned in the book of Acts. The apostle Paul himself. They all have this gifting. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says that this prophetic gift is to be sought above other gifts because of the impact it has on the life of the church. Remember, why are spiritual gifts given? For the common good, to build, to advance. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, I'd rather speak five intelligent words to instruct others than thousands of words that others can't understand. That's chapter 14 and verse 19. So this is a speaking gift, and it's one that's prophetic, it's powerful, It cuts to the core, and it's a thus saith the Lord. This is God speaking to his people. It's a very important gift to the life of the church, right? By the way, Paul gives great instruction, chapter 14, about how it's to be used. If you were to take time to unpack that chapter, you'd be reminded that in the public setting, those who speak a prophetic word are still under the shepherd or the pastor of that church, and so what they speak is to be sifted and weighed. Is to be considered in relation to God's word and what it speaks as a whole. They're to take turns speaking. The the worship service is to be orderly, not chaotic. Why does Paul even have to say that? Could it be that in Corinth it's chaotic so often? Could it be that there are things happening in the midst of a worship service where, yes, a prophetic gift is there and it's being used, but it's this person and then this person and that, and it's back and forth and it's just chaotic. And Paul says, that's not how God designed spiritual gifts to be used. The, the Spirit gives you self-control. Do you remember that? Through the Spirit, self-control. So you know how to start and stop. And self-control says, it's time for me to stop. And someone else says something, or we need to allow the Spirit of God to speak uh, through this person over here. So we've got this picture of prophecy, and it's held up as saying, these have the greatest impact for the life of the church. Now Paul, remember, he's correcting something in the local church. There's something in Corinth that has gone astray. Notice what he says next in 1 Corinthians 12. To another, uh, there is the gift of distinguishing and discerning between spirits. In other words, being able by the Spirit of God to discern whether something that is being spoken finds its origin in God, in His Spirit, or an evil spirit, something other than God. Do you remember Jesus 
modeling this as he interacts with Peter and the question of who do people say that I am and and Peter responds you are the Christ the son of the living God and Jesus response was you didn't come up with that God revealed that to you that's that's the gift of discernment is it not and so in that moment Jesus affirms this is coming from the father it's truth this is exactly what the father wants you to know and to understand what happened just a short while later when Jesus starts talking about, and I must suffer, and I must die on the cross, how we sang, oh, how he loves me. Were you not thinking of the cross as you sang that song? Who am I that God himself would die for me? Who am I that he would shed his blood? The cross. Oh, how he loves me. When Peter heard that, he said, oh, oh, you don't need to go to the cross. And what does Jesus say in response? Get behind me, Satan. What's the source there? Well, that was not the Spirit of God speaking. That was a human being speaking that does not have in mind the things of God. And Jesus expresses that. A gift of discerning spirits. And the purpose behind that. Look with me now at verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 12. To another is given speaking in different kinds of tongues or languages. In other words, being given the ability by the Spirit to speak a language that you never learned, you never grew up with. There's earthly languages. That's Acts chapter 2. By the way, did you notice there was no gift of interpretation needed in Acts chapter 2? There is no interpretation. Why? Because the people that are listening, and they're from all over the Roman Empire, they're turning, and, and, and Dr. Luke describes where from the empire they were, from all over and all these people are saying, how are these Galilean people talking my language? Praising God, talking about Messiah, talking about the gospel. How is that possible? They've got this question, right? But, but they understood it was an earthly language, and it was their language, and for the first time they're hearing the gospel and Christ, the risen Christ, and Peter bears witness to Christ in that way. So there's no interpretation needed or given at that moment. Earthly languages. But in 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul also says there's also heavenly languages, the language of angels, and, and a prayer language that represents between yourself and God. And it can be used privately or publicly, but if it's used publicly in a service, there's to be interpretation. So someone else must have a gift of interpretation. Those two things go together. Or if you don't have that gift, you've got the gift of languages, but someone else would need to use the gift of interpretation if it was to be used in a service. Guess what's happening in Corinth? Here's where some of the ignorance and misunderstanding is going on. There, there were those who were using this gift of languages in such a way that it was becoming chaotic in the church. And there was misunderstanding. And there were some that were suggesting that we have this gift and you don't and obviously you missed out. And Paul's setting the record straight and saying, just a minute. There are many gifts that the Spirit pours out. This is one of them. Very valid gift, but there are many, many gifts. And so let's bear those things in mind. So the Spirit-given ability to translate what's being said so the rest of the church can be built up and, and encouraged, that's the gift of interpretation that goes with the gift of languages. And there's an appropriate place for that. Again, 1 Corinthians 14 gives a great deal of instruction there. In fact, it says if there's no gift of interpretation then the speaker is to keep quiet in the church and, and speak to himself and to God. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I have been in services where the gift of languages is being used. But sadly, those that are in charge of that service are not following 1 Corinthians 14, and it's just a free-for-all. I mean, it's just everywhere and everything. And, and Paul makes the point, he says, if that's how it's happening, someone's going to come in and say, these people have lost their mind. I mean, what's going on here? And it, and it becomes extreme, and it's something that's not what the Spirit intends that to be. And the, the gift of languages, especially that heavenly language, that prayer language, is powerful and significant. And there are times where the Spirit wants that spoken into the life of the church through interpretation. And many times it's just between you and the Lord, and it's okay. Because the Spirit prays according to the will of God. And the Father understands what's being prayed. It's okay. But it doesn't have to be shared with everybody and everything. 
Can you see how Paul is trying to correct some things that are out of balance and just not the way that they're meant to be? In Corinth, there were some that just kind of got that turned around. And, and we, we see that often even with our own time and our own generation. So I'm going to speak to the elephant in the room. There are some of us that have perhaps grown up in a church setting or at least have heard about uh, that which has said, well, the evidence that you receive the fullness of God's Spirit is if you have the gift of tongues or uh, languages. That's the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Can I remind you what God's Word says? It says no. That's not true. Certainly it comes from the Spirit. Certainly it's a valid gift. But it's not the evidence. Would you look with me at verse 29 and 30 in 1 Corinthians 12? Paul asks some rhetorical questions. He's listed giftings, and then he says this. Is everyone an apostle? What's the implied answer? No. Okay, let's keep reading. Are all prophets? Does everybody have to get the prophecy? No. Okay. Are all teachers? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. Now, Paul is not in any way saying that any of those gifts are unimportant. He says, no, they're all important for building the church and advancing the cause of Christ. As they're used and as the Spirit of God determines. Because remember what we learned last week? The sovereign Spirit determines what gift we receive. I don't. You don't. Someone else doesn't. It's the Spirit who decides. And he gives what's going to best serve the church. Build the church. Advance the church. Now, in no way is Paul saying that the gift of languages is not important. He says, no, it's very important. It has a role. But it's not the most important. In fact, Paul says prophecy is that one. Right? He just turns it right around. So we've got these speaking gifts that are so important. And sadly, sometimes in the church, we've allowed those gifts to actually divide people and separate people instead of uniting people. The very opposite of what God wants to do by his spirit. So we have a better understanding. This gift of languages, there's a place for it, right? Whether it's an earthly language or a heavenly language that God might gift in a certain way to build the church and advance the cause of Christ. Gift of discernment needed as that's being used in the service. Paul goes on, verse 28 and 29. Notice it mentions teaching. This spiritual gift is the ability from the Spirit to communicate God's Word in a way that's clear, understandable, and helps people understand the spiritual truth that's being presented from God's Word. Paul has this gift. He has a prophetic gift, and by the way, he has a gift of tongues or languages too. He has that gift mix, not one, but multiples. And in that way, he's able to present the Word of God. You might remember Priscilla and Aquila in Scripture. They too had this gift, this gift of teaching. And you might remember that they took a, a gentleman by the name of Apollos, and they, and they sat him down, and they said, Apollos, there's more you need to understand about the gospel, and they proceeded to educate him in the way of God, more adequately. The gift of teaching. A significant gift to the life of the church. And then lastly, let me know for us evangelism, which is the ability to testify of Jesus through word and action in a way that's persuasive and helps people turn their heart and soul to Christ. And they turn to him in faith. This gift of evangelism. Did you know that about 10% of believers in the body of Christ have that gifting? Okay, Pastor, that means one in ten. What about the other nine? Well, you may not be gifted in evangelism, but you and I, and I count myself in that number, you and I are still responsible for evangelism. We're still responsible to bear witness to Christ with our words and our actions. But these folks that have the gift of evangelism have a unique ability by God's Spirit to present truth and present Christ in such a way people are compelled, they come to faith in Christ. And we love to see when, when those things are happening, um, again, the Lord compels people to come to himself through that word uh, of evangelism. So important. Second Corinthians 5 talks about how Christ's love compels us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Paul to Timothy, hey, Tim, do the work of an evangelist, right? Second Timothy 4.4, 4, uh, Matthew 5, <clears throat> 14 through 16, as you let your light shine. Uh, as you do good, um, they can, the people can see your good deeds and they'll praise your Father in heaven. Evangelism is a speaking gift. Please don't t 
take a stance that just says, well, I let people know about Jesus by what I do. Well, good. Now are you going to talk about them too? Because sometimes people need to get the dots connected and it actually takes words. And in fact, the word evangelism means speaking words. It's word and deed together. All right? So we've got this gifting. And these are speaking gifts. They're significant. Can you see how it builds the church and advances the cause of Christ? Now you're going to relax a little bit because I've taken more time on this category than I will in the next categories. Okay? This is not an African service this morning, even though I do need to get to Spokane, you know. Do you mind having a three-hour service? Is that okay? <laughs> it's a great experience to be in the midst of, right? It's like, oh, boy. Phil knows this. He grew up with it far more than I did. So, all right. Let's look at the serving gifts, second category. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Um, there, there are gifts of administration. And it dawned on me for the very first time as I was studying this, it says plural, gifts plural. I'd never thought about that gifting as a plural gift, as in more than one expression. But this gift of uh, administration is the ability from the Spirit to grasp God's plan for the church and then develop, organize, and implement a strategy to help the church reach the goal. And, And it takes gifting in those areas. We see this gifting in action in Acts chapter 6 and verses 5 through 7, where the 12 are dealing with some women that are being left out for the distribution of benevolent help. And and the apostles are saying, you know, we want to focus on prayer and the word. And so we need spirit-filled, wise people to administer these gifts. And they come up with this plan. And we see the gift of administration in action through the apostles. That's one gift of serving. Another is the gift of apostle. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 29. In the church, God appointed first of all the apostles. Ephesians 4, 11, similarly, is a gift of grace. The apostles. The word apostle means sent one, sent on a mission, having a task that the master has entrusted to them. And the way you and I would translate that today is international worker, formerly missionary, right? Someone that's been tasked by the Spirit of God to take God's gospel and present it to the nations to win the loss to faith in Christ. So John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Now some have taken the word apostle and said that only relates to the 12 who are called apostles, and then later on Paul was added to that number and so forth, and, and Judas's place was uh, filled up by yet another, right? But, but apostle means more than just the 12. The evidence to that is found in Romans 16 and verse 7 where Paul's talking about two people that happen to be relatives, part of the family, his extended family, in prison with him. And he says concerning them, they are outstanding among the apostles, plural, and in Christ even before I was. This, this apostle or apostolic gifting is one of being sent to the nations as a sent one. So one of the things I'm looking forward to at council is as we get to council, there are over 40 apostles, sent ones, They're about to be commissioned and sent out to the nations at Council 2023. Does that encourage your heart? How is it that they're there in that way? Is it not because the Spirit of God has gifted them, called them, and is now sending them to do that work? Serving the church in that way, advancing the cause of Christ. Here's one that perhaps you've not thought about before. How about artistic creativity? In Exodus chapter 31, as God reveals his blueprint for the tabernacle... He says concerning some craftsmen, I will place my spirit on them and they will have the ability to artistically create that which I envision for the tabernacle. And we're talking working with gold and silver and precious metals and weaving and sewing and graphic design and all those kinds of things. Artistic creativity as a spiritual gift. That which points people towards Christ, that which lifts up and exalts the the Father. This is a gifting, I think, that's being rediscovered in the church today. And I'm grateful that it is. There are many expressions of this. could be poetry or the spoken word, for example. Um, There's drama. There's there's other expressions over this artistic creativity. Romans 12, 6 says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. But if, verse 8, your gift is encouraging, then encourage. Right? You thought about the gift of encouragement as a serving gift. 
To encourage means you put courage into people. You inspire hope. You instill strength. You help them to persevere. Encouragement can be strong exhortation too. There could be a sting to it. It's still encouraging. Right? It's to help us move forward in the direction Christ is calling us. Who was the person in scripture that was known as the son of encouragement? Barnabas. Barnabas. Right? Literally what it means. The apostles saw this man in action and they gave him that nickname. They just said, you live this out. We see this gift in you. We acknowledge it. And he lived it out for the sake of the church. Encouragement, serving. How about the gift of faith? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9. The gift of faith is the ability to believe God for provision or supply that's extraordinary in specific situations. It's stepping out. It's mountain-moving faith. Jesus to Martha, did I not tell you if you believe, you'll see God's glory. And so move the stone so that Lazarus might be raised up. Peter, stepping out of the boat. Did you notice the other 11 didn't? Peter did. Gift of faith. And it's beyond ordinary faith, if you will. Trusting God for God to do something extraordinary. Romans 12, 8 talks about generous giving. The ability to give sacrificially towards ministry efforts that build the church, advance the kingdom, help others. Again, Barnabas had this in his mix, didn't he? He encouraged and he was very generous. He took land that he owned, sold it, and gave it all to the apostles to help the needy. This was God's gift to him, and he passed it on for the sake of the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 also talks about the gift of helps. And Romans 12, 7 talks about the gift of service. And those two often go together. Helps and service. It's playing a supporting role behind the scenes, freeing others to serve more in the forefront or spotlight, if you will. But it's seeing need in someone's life and coming alongside and helping and serving in that way that releases others in the church to use their gifting in more efficient ways. Helps and service. That's, that's a gifting that many of us actually have. Nobody had to tell us we had to do something because the Spirit of God had prompted us said, I see this and I'm moving towards it. I'm doing something about it right now. Helps and service. 1 Peter 4.9 mentions hospitality. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Why do you think it says that? I've often wondered about that. Lord, this is a spiritual gift. Why did you have to add that part about don't grumble? I'll let you think about that. All right? It's, it's something we do joyfully, cheerfully. What is hospitality? It's to take someone who's perhaps a stranger or they're not someone of your family or whatever, but you make them feel like family. And they're welcomed warmly. And, and so this becomes like home. Is it possible that Mary and Martha exercised some of that as they welcomed Jesus and the disciples so often into their home, right? How about the gift of intercession? Believing God for breakthrough, intercessory prayer, tenacity, grit, perseverance in prayer. Anna, Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38, spending decades of her life crying out to the Lord at, at the temple for God to bring Messiah, an expression of that intercession. Perhaps Epaphras, Colossians 4, verse 12, who's always wrestling in prayer for you. The scripture says, if your gifting is leadership, then lead or govern diligently. Leadership, this, this ability to help people move in unity in the direction that God is taking his church. Do we not need more leaders of that caliber? Not just in the church, but is it fair to say in our country? Unity is not a premium in our country. But what about spirit-filled, Christ-honoring followers who know how to lead in that way? The expression of it. Mercy. Not treating people the way they deserve. Romans 12, 8 says, if your gift is mercy, then do it cheerfully. This gift of mercy it alleviates suffering. It offers hope. Let me suggest another serving gift. It's called music, song. I'm thinking about David in the scriptures and God's spirit upon him and helping him as he expressed that. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music with all my soul to play instrumentally, an instrument, vocally, singing, those kinds of things in a way where the focus is on the Lord, not on the singer, not on the musician. It's on the one to whom we 
worship and the one who alone is worthy of honor and glory. And that gifting in that way, it inspires others to step into a deeper level of worship, song, music. There's another gift of serving, and that is pastor shepherds. Ephesians 4, verse 11. As I understand scripture, I believe there's a hyphen there. Pastor, hyphen, shepherd. They go together, okay? And, and in that sense, Christ the good shepherd, laying down his life for the sake of the sheep, uh, the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians, respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Uh, this is this gift of shepherding and caring for people, pastor, teacher, those things kind of rolling together. This may help you. Did you know that not every pastor has a gift of shepherd? They may be a great teacher, but lack some shepherding things because that's not their gifting. It's not their mix. And yet, how many times do we have the expectation that every pastor should be a great shepherd? It doesn't always work that way. It's about gifting again, isn't it? And how God might put those things uh, together. All right, so we've got serving gifts, speaking gifts. Are you resonating with some of these now? Have you done the survey where you're saying, I have a better understanding of where I fit in that? Let's move to the third category, signs and wonders. 1 Corinthians 12, 10. The Spirit gives to another miraculous powers, plural. The Spirit enabling someone to do something that is out of the ordinary, that is miraculous, the purpose being to authenticate the power of the gospel in the person of Christ. In Jesus' name, this happened. And it's about representing Christ to the nations. It's about building his church, advancing the cause of the kingdom. And so the miraculous that's uh, happening right in front of us in that way. Hebrews 2, verse 3. This salvation first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God testified to it by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Do you notice again? The sovereign spirit determines... And in this situation, he determined that he would pour forth miraculous powers on some to authenticate the gospel. Often you've got signs and wonders here and gifts of healing right here, right next to it. All right, so gifts of healing where it's not requiring a doctor or medicines or stuff like that, but God supernaturally ministers healing in someone's life. And friends, notice it's plural. Gifts, plural. More than one expression. Now, again, is it intended to point someone out and say, oh, this person is a healer. It's all about them. Is that what it's about? No, it's about the Spirit of God. We heal in the name of Jesus. You might remember Peter saying, I don't have silver and gold, but what I have I give you now in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and what? Walk. And God supernaturally healed. Peter exercising this gift of healing as God enabled him. Signs and wonders. Again, the purpose is to authenticate the gospel and demonstrate who Jesus Christ is, the very Son of God. What about some other gifts, some significant other gifts? Let me quickly wrap up with these. The first would be this, the gift of signalness or celibacy. This is a gifting from the Spirit where one is able to live life as a single in order to maximize kingdom impact. They're not burdened with care of spouse or family. This is not for everyone. In fact, the scripture would suggest that for the lion's share of us, singleness is not the best way for us to go. But it is for some people. And it's by God's enabling. So you've got the Apostle Paul expressing that in his own life. Certainly the Lord Jesus modeled that for us in order to exclusively focus on building the church and advancing the gospel. The gift of singleness or celibacy, something that that God places there. So... If you don't have that gifting, it's not wise to continue necessarily down that road, is it? Where <clears throat> that can create problems down the road. If we don't have the gifting, we act like we do. Sadly, some in the church have suggested that that's the way it's supposed to be. And, but what if you're not gifted that way? And what a uh, train wreck that can be. What about this one from 1 Corinthians 13? If I give all I possess to the poor, voluntary poverty... Did Jesus not say to the rich young ruler, you need to give it all up? Was he inviting him to step into a gifting of voluntary poverty because for him, he needed to step away from the materialistic stuff so he could focus on what mattered most, kingdom, 
Christ. And so Jesus invited him to go there. This is a powerful tool, isn't it? Someone who's willing to lay down all the material things in order to serve those who have great need. A powerful tool for advancing the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 13.3 also talks about this. What if I give all I possess to the poor and I surrender my body to the flames? What is that? Martyrdom. A spiritual given ability to joyfully endure suffering to the point of dying. To testify to the greatness of Christ. I got to tell you, this gift, you only use it once. The gift of martyrdom. Something that God, again, enables in the midst of. We've got Stephen as an example in the book of Acts. Uh, There are many examples in history, right, of those whom God equips in that way. Significant spiritual gifting. But I have this question from 1 Peter 4.10. Are there still others? So 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each one should use whatever gift he or she has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in all of its forms. Notice these are gifts of grace. Graciously administering to others. It builds up God's people, the church, advances the cause of Christ. Are there some other possible gifts? Peter Wagner suggested, what about the gift of uh, spiritual deliverance? There are those who are gifted in special ways in in that particular area, and it's by God's spirit uh, that they function. Is that uh, yet another spiritual gift? Christian Schwartz from Germany has suggested, what about the gift of counseling, taking that gift of wisdom and applying it in life situations in very specific ways? And is that another expression of God's gifting by his spirit that's there to build the church and advance the cause? Can you see where this goes? The spirit of God gifting his people to build up the church, advance the cause of Christ. This is why God's given his gifting. And then we're left this question, right? Lord, what's my gift? What are my gifts? What kind of mix do I have in my life? What have you poured into my life? The scripture says it's okay to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Paul says eagerly desire the ones that will make the most impact for the sake of the kingdom. But the spirit of God will decide what gifts we receive, right? And so we, we seek, we ask, and the Spirit makes his determination, and he provides. So what do I do with this? How do I um, understand my use of the spiritual gifting? I'm going to suggest to you five things that Peter Wagner put out there in his book, Understanding Your Spiritual Gift. Five E's. First one is this, explore the options. That's what we did this morning. Study of God's Word. What are the options? What are the giftings that God offers to us? Second E, experiment by engaging in ministries that require a certain kind of gifting. I'm going to just tell you right here now that when it comes to working with people that have great um, need and are in a place perhaps of poverty and neediness and, and other things like that, I can tell you that when I work in those areas, that is not my gifting. And I know it very clearly. I lack the patience, the graciousness, and some other things that are much needed. I'm going to put Phil on the spot and suggest that he has some gifting in this area that I sure don't have. But there's some things in Phil that I've so loved and appreciated that he's gifted in a certain way and it's powerful in watching what God does with that. It's okay. The gifting in my life looks different than the gifting in Phil's life. God made the church together that way, didn't he? So we experiment. And, and one of the things is when you're experimenting, you're trying that, you examine, third E, examine your heart and emotions. Do you, does it leave you feeling energized or drained? Frustrated? Out of sorts? If, if it leaves you feeling drained and frustrated, and etc., that's not your area of gifting. Because when you function in your gifting, the Spirit of God energizes and empowers. And you know that you're in the middle of right where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's how he wired you. It's how he's gifted you. Examine your heart. Evaluate effectiveness. Is it producing fruit? To say, I have the gift of evangelism, but I've never led anyone to Christ. I don't think so. Right? Fruit. It'll be there, won't it? We should see evidence that the Spirit of God is working in and through us. I mean, Peter hadn't exactly led a whole lot of people of faith in Christ before Pentecost. One day, 3,000? Fruit. Right? He was exercising a gifting that was new to him. And then expect confirmation from others in the church. You see, the point of the church is we rally around each other 
And I had the privilege of doing this this morning. Someone was talking a little to me, to me about some gifting that they sensed was in their life. And I'm just nodding my head and saying, I see that in you. I do. I see that in you. And so we can affirm that, and it helps someone then continue on in their gifting. Or we might say to someone, you know, I realize you feel like this may be your area of gifting, but I don't know that I can affirm that. I think perhaps that gifting is more over this direction. Have you considered exploring that further? So where does this take us? God's Spirit has been given to those who follow Christ. His fullness is available. We're to pray for the infilling of the Spirit over and over again. Be filled constantly, Ephesians 5.18. His gifting is given in order to build the church and advance the cause of Christ. And he's inviting you and I to use those gifts in such a way that we're doing our part. Every part doing its part. This is what God's calling us to be and to do. So our worship team is going to come. They're going to close out our service with a closing song. And, and as they do so, perhaps God would just be speaking to your heart and saying, what is it that I've placed in your life that you can use that will build the church and advance the cause of Christ? God's calling us to be faithful in those things.